Here we go. We are listening to Law and Gospel on this Monday, May the 16th, in the year of our Lord, 2023. I'm Pastor Tom Baker, and normally we take a look at the lessons for the coming Sunday, which is the seventh Sunday of Easter. However, this week, there is another great celebration. It's called the Ascension, and it will be occurring on Thursday. Many congregations do not have a Thursday night worship service. Although two of the four congregations I'm serving right now, I will be preaching to them on Thursday. So they're getting ready to worship on the Ascension. But many congregations will be talking about the Ascension on Sunday. So the readings for the Ascension are Acts chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, and Luke chapter 24. So let's start with Acts chapter 1. In the first book, O Theophilus. Now, who's writing this book of Acts? It's actually the Apostle Luke. And he already has talked to Theophilus. Theophilus is an interesting name. It is made up of two Greek words. Theos, meaning God, and philia, meaning love. So it looks like this is maybe an adult instruction person who is Greek. And, well, Acts and Luke is trying to help him understand. So we're talking about Theophilus. And he was an adult instruction person that Luke is helping to understand all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. Taken up means he was ascended into heaven. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So what did he tell them? He said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And that will be occurring on Pentecost. So in verse 6 of chapter 1 of Acts, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So even at this time, after the resurrection of Christ from the dead, they're still confused about what the kingdom of Israel is. They're really thinking that perhaps Jesus will do what he did with the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, give food, shelter, and really give a wonderful life to those living in Israel. But that's not going to be happening because the kingdom of Israel is not about this world. It's about the Holy Christian Church. He says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he is saying these things, they're looking at him and he is lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, Two men stood by them in white robes. These, of course, are angels. And said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? 
this Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So this is talking about the day of judgment, when Jesus will appear again in the clouds of heaven. And that's when many who are saved will be taken into heaven in their bodies. And those who are already in heaven in the spirit will receive their bodies risen from the dead. So the Apostle Paul picks up on the ascension in Ephesians chapter 1. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And he talks about when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and then seated at the right hand of God the Father in the heavenly places. For above all rule and authority and power and dominions and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And God the Father put all things under the feet of Jesus and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fits all in all. So this is very important about the ascension, for this is when Jesus goes to heaven and he receives headship over the church. This is why we believe, teach, and confess that you and I as believers right now are at the right hand of God because we are part of the body of Christ. And being part of the body of Christ simply means that wherever the head is, so also is the body. So in reality, from a spiritual point of view, we are definitely with Jesus. In Luke 24, uh, the Apostle Paul, I'm sorry, the Apostle Luke says, from the point of Jesus, these are my words that I spoke to you while I am still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then verse 45 is really important. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now we remember this occurred with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They were very confused. Their wonderful leader had been crucified. He was now lying in the grave, they thought. But they heard about women saying he had risen from the dead. Jesus opened up their minds to the scriptures. Notice what he did. He preached the Old Testament. There were many, many passages in the Old Testament that indicated the promises of Jesus that he would suffer, that he would die on the cross, that he would be whipped, that he would be mocked. And these promises Jesus said were to be fulfilled. This is how we witness. If you remember, there was a passage from the, let's see, Paul, when he was talking to philosophers in Athens. It says he reasoned with them. This didn't mean that he began to use human reason 
to explain the message of the Christian faith. Human reason cannot explain the message of Christianity. There are even hymns that speak about the lack of human reason in convincing anyone about the truth of Jesus Christ. How do you witness to someone then? You do the same thing that Jesus did. You simply quote scripture and you leave the results up to the Holy Spirit. Thus it is written, and this is looking at Luke 24, when Jesus opened their understanding of the scriptures, it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. You are witnesses of these things. And Jesus says in verse 49 of Luke 24, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. That's talking about Pentecost, when they will be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then verse 50, and this is in Luke, And Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while blessing them, he departs from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Now, what does that mean? Do you ever bless God? Yes. The answer is, you bless God every time you worship. Because in worship, you give glory and honor and praise to God. Listen carefully to the liturgy that we often use in the Lutheran Church. It's a liturgy that really shows that God and He alone, He is the person who has given us salvation. The Father has created us, along with the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus has redeemed us alone, dying on the cross, and the Holy Spirit has given us comfort. So the ascension of Jesus is really critical. How critical is it? Well, Jesus is regarded as prophet, priest, and king. Where did that come from? In the Old Testament, God would help lead the people through those who were representing himself, the prophet, the priest, and the king. Moses was a great prophet. There also was a priest and a king. And these were people that God had put over the nation of Israel. When Jesus was on earth, he also was prophet, priest, and king. He was prophet because he taught the scripture. He opened the scriptures to understand salvation. All about that the Christ would suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that the message was one of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This is very important to understand. Last week, among the emails I received was one from California of an individual saying that I have become his favorite pastor. And he listens to KFUO Law and Gospel every day. I corrected him. I don't want to be considered his favorite pastor. 
The reason I'm hoping he likes what I have to say on Law and Gospel and what the other programs on KFUO say is because his favorite person is really Jesus. And that's who we are talking about. So it is not the messenger that is the one that you give glory to. It is the message that is so important. And that's the message of every person who's on KFUO in helping you to understand the scriptures, helping you to understand how Jesus is indeed our heavenly prophet. Now, how is he our heavenly prophet? When I stand up to give a sermon, that sermon is really Jesus speaking. I simply repeat what Jesus has to say, and that is proper, proper ministry. And that proper ministry is something that occurs all the time in the Word of God. Remember what Jesus says. The two parts of his ministry are repentance of sins and the forgiveness of sins. Repentance comes about by the law because one of the uses that God makes of the law is to show us our sin, to accuse us of falling short of the glory of God. Why is that important? Because until someone comes to that recognition, they don't really understand their need for a Savior. Every religion in the world puts your being saved on your own shoulders. They tell you what you have to do, how you have to act, how you have to behave. The law can never save you because what is important about the law is not only what you do, but what motivates you to do what you do. And apart from faith in Jesus Christ, your motivation is always self-centered. I mean, how many times have you seen somebody say, okay, what's in it for me? They're always looking toward themselves. And, and so they may do a lot of good works, may help feed the hungry, may help give homes to the people who don't have anywhere to live or clothes to the naked or visit people in prison. But they do so as an unbeliever because it makes them feel good about themselves and it makes them look good to other people. That is in contrast to what Jesus did. Yesterday was Mother's Day, and I made the point in the sermon that we honor mothers by telling people what our mother did for us. In other words, you can listen to everybody in the congregation talk about the wonders of their mothers and it won't comfort you because they are not your mothers. Motherhood is the time to praise the mother that God has given you for bringing you up in the faith, for really taking care of you when you were sick, being always at your side. That is the task of mothers, and they ought to be praised. But... Talking about Jesus is different. For when you talk about Jesus, you're not talking about, oh, here's why I believe in Jesus. Look at all the things he does for me, like we talk about our mothers. No, when we talk about Jesus, we're really saying, look at all the things he does for you. That's the difference between motherhood and Christianity. While there's a place to honor fathers and mothers as God's representatives to us, 
when we talk about Jesus. He is also the representative to those who are not part of our family. So we tell them what Jesus has done for them. That is what it means to explain the scriptures to people. So Jesus is a prophet in proclaiming the word of God. He's also a priest. Now, what did a priest do? In the Old Testament, a priest did two things. Number one, he sacrificed on behalf of the people. Remember the high priest? He went into the Holy of Holies once a year to sacrifice for the people. Jesus has already done the sacrifice. But the other task of the priest was also to pray for the people. It's of some note to remember that the Lord's Prayer is a prayer where we're asking seven times for Jesus to keep his promises. The promises that he is our Father in heaven, that through him the kingdom comes, that through him we get bread, through him we get the forgiveness of sins. Through him, we are kept from all evil and the devil we are delivered from on the day of our death. The Lord's Prayer is a perfect prayer because we are praying for what Jesus has promised in each of the petitions. And therefore, when we pray that, we don't add, if it be your will, because we know it is his will. When we pray for things that are not found in Scripture, not promised, then we add, if it be your will, like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. And therefore, Jesus also answers yes to our prayer. Because when we say, thy will be done, not my will, God's answer is, this is my will for you. And he always answers every request we ask him, either in keeping it because it's a promise, like in the Lord's Prayer, or in giving us the best. All things work together for our good. That's why prayer is so important. As we speak in the name of Jesus, which means we have all hope and faith in him, what does that mean? It means we believe that Jesus will keep his promises. There isn't a promise that he will not keep, including when we say, not my will, but thy will be done. Yes, it will be my will. Now, at times, we may recognize or not recognize God's will being done because we don't get what we want. But that means that God has a bigger purpose in our life. The ascension is Jesus, who is indeed our prophet, who continues to speak to us through worship. You can hear him when you read the Bible. Are you depressed at times? Open the book of Psalms, because Psalms will help you. It has many, many promises from God of taking care of you, of comforting you, of bringing you to a recognition of understanding the scriptures. There are hundreds of passages in the Bible that say something, and you're really not sure what they mean. For example, one of the most difficult books to understand is the book of Proverbs written by Solomon. He says so many things in it, and when you read them in the English, what does he mean by those things? And that's why it's important that a pastor trained in the original languages and understanding the theology of Jesus' day is able to explain to you these passages from the book of Proverbs. That's Jesus, who is also 
not only your prophet, not only your priest, but he's also your king. What does that mean? It means he holds the whole world in his hands. There is nothing that happens in your life that is not directed by Jesus. Even your pain and your suffering for the sake of the gospel. God never sends more than you can endure. That's what we're talking about in the ascension of Jesus Christ. He is the one who now at the right hand of God gives you all that you need. The Ascension is a wonderful, wonderful celebration. And we pray that you hear about it either on Thursday night or on Sunday. Tomorrow we'll take a look at an Ascension hymn about that wonderful event. God bless you. Listen to Law & Gospel each weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law & Gospel, please make your check out to Law & Gospel and mail to Law & Gospel P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri 63132 or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.